when I first saw the beaver, which would be in the early 80s, it's kind of funny, all my time in growing up, I never really saw a beaver until that day. It's kind of weird, because you know, we hunted out from here and we're out quite a bit. But now we have these engineering devices like beaver deceivers and different flow devices that can be used to help resolve conflict. Do you guys ever use those? You know, we we don't install install them. We have, um, you know, talked to people about the fact they, you know, that there are some things out there they can do. We, you know, referenced them, suggested they, you know, look online or you know those sorts of things. But we we don't. Um, we've never had a program where we've done that sort of installation work of them. That's not really your guys. Yeah. You know, it would be, uh, um, we would have to gear up a little bit differently to do, you know, to try to do something like that. And, and in terms of funding and manpower, that's not really, you know, something that we have traditionally, you know, used our funding and manpower for. We have tried to do some, um, you know, relocation work, trapping and, and transplanting. How does that work, Martha? You know, we um, we've got some live, some beaver live traps that our officers will try to use, or um, for that, or um, you know, last last year we, we had a wildlife service um, person do some live trapping for us. So um, so yeah. He was he was successful at at it and at um, catching them. Yeah, yeah. And so do, do you know if the population itself that he caught and transferred have any idea how it did? If the animal no. was still alive or we didn't mark them or anything, and we put them in a place where um, uh, yeah we they're not in a place where we can really monitor them. Uh, they went off to some private property and they're in the middle of nowhere and to just go and sit and watch people and see if they made it <laughs> when it wouldn't have been wouldn't have been possible but um, but yeah and it was a situation where they were, they were um, causing problems with in the stream of trying to do some road work and call the work at a stream and so so we often did try to have to have them live trapped and moved down. So, so we do do you know it, um, try to do some of that on our own, or at least you know try to implement that. But there are also cases where we do issue permits, you know, to take people um, because the, the need is fairly immediate, um, or you know that you know just because of the circumstances that seems like the most effective. How, how does that process work? I mean, when we take, when you're going to take a beaver, could you we, give me an example? Um, we have, we um, look at the, you know, we may get a call from a private landowner or we may get a call from, you know, one example um, that you know, you may be aware of, um, is up at Cherry Springs a couple of years ago. Uh, the Forest Service had some concerns with beaver up there at Cherry Springs, flooding their their path, um, cutting down some of the big old um, willows that are up there, and, and some infrastructure. It's mostly infrastructure concerns with the path and uh, that they had, and um, so they, you know, they were they were looking for a solution uh, to you know, reduce the beaver in that Cherry Springs area and requested a, a quick a, a, a kill permit to do that. And so we issued that we issued a kill permit. And they um, they used wildlife services to remove those to remove the beaver. And so and it was in a it was late, pretty late in the fall. Um, it would have been a a tough time to trap and move the beaver and expect them to do very well in a new in a new place right before 
winter sets in and they haven't had time to, you know, make cash and get, you know, get themselves through the, the winter. And, and so, um, so that was the solution we found. You know, we came up with there. And, you know, every case was a little bit unique and different. But, and, and it was in a, you know, a place where those beaver, um, you know, they'll eventually come back into that area and they'll eventually start gnawing on those big pretty willows again and they'll eventually re-flood that, you know, have new, more issues there just because there are you know, the hard deeper in the in the creek drainage. So I'm sure eventually they'll get back into that area again. See, I guess one of the, for me, since I have studied a little bit. I'm not, I, I don't claim to be an expert. Mm -hmm. But one of the things like Massachusetts, where they, they kind of don't allow trapping in that state, so they kind of had to deal with a lot of beaver problems. And from my understanding, 98% of those problems can be solved with engineering. About 2% of them are usually live trapped and removed out. Because there are circumstances where they're not you know, they just can't get it to work. Mm -hmm. So that would be one of the things that, you know, I would just hope that would be explored the next time, you know, in Cherry Springs. Hi, I'm Paul. Paul or Mark. Nice to meet you, Mark. I read your article in the Idaho State no. Journal with Jeff. Mm -hmm. It was nice. But as far as that area, you know, I'm not sure if flow devices would work, but one of the things I've kind of learned is that when they relocate, unless they're going into a situation for success, which would mean probably going into a place where they have a pond for safety, mm -hmm. several ponds, but that usually isn't too success. Yeah. So I don't know if I'm saying just go ahead and kill them or not. Yeah. Now that's up to you. Babe. Well, and then that is so it's just something to so think about. What's the example you just used? I, I was he was as, he was asking about you know where it, examples of where we may um, either try to live trap or give or have kill permits and how that process would work. And so I was using our Cherry Springs work with the Forest Service as an example. And um, so yeah, and and. You know, perhaps engineering could work 90% of the time. I don't know, but that's not, it's not something, like I said before, that we have the manpower and the, the funding within our agency to, you know, do in every situation. A lot of, a lot of those, cons some are, you know, a fair number of the concerns we have with flooding culverts and roads and things like that are on, um, Forest Service property, um, you know, or they're a county road, um, those sorts of things. And so, you know, a partnership with, with those entities may be possible, but they're kind of in the same boat we are in terms of funding and manpower to do those things. So, Paul, what are your concerns with the options that Martha's described at Cherry Springs, for, for example? Uh, I don't, to be honest, Mark. Well, what are your purpose? What are you her, 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 her concerns and your guys' concerns? I'm not the fishing game. I, it, it's not my call on any of that. You're a stakeholder. Is what what you want? Yeah, to I'm a stakeholder. So that, yeah. that's why I'm asking. Yeah, I I think for me the only thing that uh, I would suggest is you know the flow devices seem to give them a chance because. Like as far as roads, let's <clears throat> we jump up to like uh, this beaver that's up at Scout Mountain at the Justice Park, and let me tell you, coming back from Justice Park, I saw a weasel cross the road that was larger than a cat with a big black tail, and if uh, you know the pictures on the internet are right, I'd call it a fisher, and that's not too far from that beaver pond, and I thought that was really super cool. It could have been a Martin. Um, we're kind of, 
we're out of what we typically think of as Fisher range, but we're certainly within Pine Martin range, um, which they look very similar, and their size even overlaps um, a little bit. Do I saw but, a Martin? So you may have seen a Martin, and you may have seen a Fisher, but it would be it would be out of typical Fisher range. Yeah. But Pine Martin is much more probable, okay. which is really cool. It <laughs> was super cool, as dark as cool. But as far as like that culvert, you know, I went up and I helped. You know, I, I filmed it. They put up, a, I guess, some Indian told Mike to tell that if she put a sheet up with two posts, it acts as a deterrent. It seemed to work really well because we saw that. We went up and and looked at that, and we 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 talked with the Forest Service about you know that situation, and and um, you know they're uh, I think. They're kind of taking a, a wait and see sort of approach right now. Um, you know, they had originally asked us to, to help remove those beaver to trap and transplant them someplace else. And in our discussions with them, we've kind of come to the agreement that, you know, let's, let's hold off for the time being and see if there's, you know, some other solution. So, um, so yeah. Mention. You mentioned the flow devices, Paul. Are you talking about the, <coughs> the equalizing device to maintain a stable pool of water behind the dam? Right. Okay, you understand that's not a solution to the problem with Cherry Springs Group. Yes, Well, he can. I don't know. Did you say anything to him about Well, I told coming? him I was coming up. Oh, that's probably why he's here then, I guess. Yeah. Right. So, the, uh, the, flow, the, the equalizing devices are designed to maintain a stable pool of water so flooding doesn't occur outside the perimeter of the dam. Yeah. It doesn't prevent a beaver from, kind of, from plugging up the culvert itself. So that's not a solution with a Cherry Springs issue. A beaver exclusion device, which is similar to what you saw, but, saw, but typically with hardware cloth, or some other porous barrier there that prevents beavers from blocking the dam itself, the, the culvert trying to create a dam right there. That's a common technique for trying to manage culvert, culvert problems. And the, and the flow equalizing devices have been used for years and years. They're not a new piece of technology. Now, now is that what's that hood owl? That, I think Mike put one in there, was it last summer? I think Mike. The equalizing device? Yeah, I think he put one he, he in. He put several around, um, around the creek. On Rapid Creek. Yeah, um, I worked on that one. Yeah, and I haven't been by it. I went, I was, I drove through there last fall, and the pipe, before it was put in, there was just, there was right, <coughs> right to the there right. were pipes laying there waiting to be yeah. put in, but I haven't been by to look at it since it's been put in to see how it's going. Have you? Yeah, yeah, well, it's been a while too for me. And it looks like doing it's doing what it was supposed to do. The time. Yeah. I haven't been up there this summer. Okay. Yeah, my neighbor, he delivers the mail there, and he keeps telling me to go rookie. I always go up to the creek. I don't ever go that way. No, really, I don't deliver mail there. And so, when that, she got lost up at McNabb Creek, and we had a call search and rescue one time. She had, <laughs> yeah, my son who's eight now was a baby at the time. And that, that direction for her doesn't work. Yeah. Brings up some pretty horrid. Yeah, wow, that's yeah. the topic to see now. Well, but from what my neighbor morning, says, it's pretty dark. He, he appreciates it and he likes the pond. What's really cool about the West Fork is that it's a pristine stream. Hi. You know, in a urban environment, get a shot of that guy going up the trail. And, and yeah, that attitude's changing. I mean, I'm not Shoshone Indian. I am a credit, you know, my credit and I go use the clinic. We're Eastern Indians. And uh, our, in our culture, we decimated deer populations, elk populations, bison populations, and the things they call the leather trade. People needed skins, and so we were pretty good hunters, I guess, and we got a lot of skins. And now, you know, that whole area is getting, you know, you're kind of coming back, and we have to reflect about who we are, what we did. And so as far as beaver now, I think the Shoshone's kind of have to think about their role in 
what they did to beaver populations. Because they, you know, they were prominent. Tra you know, they killed probably more beaver than most white people. You know, because they were getting new technologies. You know, they were getting pots and pans and guns. I mean, Shoshones had horses before anyone else, and so because they got them from their cousins, the Comanches, and anyway. The beaver provided a technology that horses couldn't get them because they were denied guns. And so they could get guns through the fur trade. And, you know, they're responsible for decimating those early beaver, those beaver populations, too. And I think they're realizing now that on the reservation, the beaver's a good thing. And I hear their goal is to have a beaver in every drainage, to have beaver populations in every drainage. I think that'd be a great goal for Idaho to have beaver populations like in Robert's Roost and where, wherever you can get them because all it can do is help with your fisheries and with you know your bird populations and all those other things. Let me, let me add some a larger perspective in terms of how education and management goes. You know, I went to the Aspen uh, thing up there. Were you there, Mark? Yeah. You know, and I interjected a, a bunch up there, making, showing you that relationship between aspens and, and beaver and, and other elements there. But what people in the long run perceive, they go, oh, aspen are things are a huge, huge organism, and if you kill it, or, you know, and you've killed this great big, huge, unique thing ever since the movie Phenomena came out, you know, mentioned that, you know, and it's gotten into the society. So if you kill a and aspen tree, it's like, oh my God. You're hurting this huge, unique creature. Now, but he has talked about until I brought it up there that day about the real, true relationship between the two animals or the yeah, the two entities, and how integrate inte integrated that is, and how throughout most of its range of that is developed through history or through the last million years, or more, much more that relationship. And to know that, like, you know, I, I ask some questions and somebody says, yeah, it is changing. We know a little bit more about that or this. But, yeah, my purpose there, as I said, I'm here for the beaver. I'm the only one that said that. You know, this is boom. You know, here we are. There's this relationship and how people perceive perceive things. Like when Mike goes, oh, the beaver cut the trees over there at uh, Gibbs, uh, Gibson Pitcher Park. Well, shoot, that was my first time there the week before. I was there basically the morning after they did the trees. And when I come the next week, and he wants to put fence around and paint sand dust on things, and I said, oh, I have wire in my teeth. You know, and I'm saying, what they need is a load of aspens. They just said, thank you. Thank you for painting aspens here. And they finally made it through town and through everything to even get there from, from the nursery area Stop. down in the lower part. So the it was the thing is, come on, there's a bunch of us. I'm there with my camera doing all this. Stuff. Let's go find out where they want to build their lodge, because it, there was no den area or a bank area to to do there, so I knew they were in that little rush. So we did, found exactly where they were going to start to build a little lodge. You know, they wanted to move in there, plenty of food. You know, kind of a protected area in the community. So, you know, but I don't even know if they're there anymore. So we, so aspen trees were brought into the Portnuff River at Edson Victor? Yeah, so we planted the aspen trees down Oh, there. planted. Oh, I thought you meant they were bringing... No, my suggestion was let's bring them a load of wood. Oh, right. okay, that was okay. I, I, <laughs> that was right. Those ideas to bring cuttings. Okay. <laughs> yeah, here you need to build the lodge. We'll help you. You know, rather you know, but they don't need help. They, they <laughs> yeah, fine on their own. That's why they say business. Well, that's why they said well, thank you for bringing those out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, if that if there's nothing there for them to eat, or then build they with probably they shouldn't be yeah. there anyway. So you know. Well, that, that's a natural cycle in beaver populations, they will remove available forage in an area and a colony will, will move to a different area. Right. Set up, set up. You know, the dam will remain, it may wash out over time, or it may, it may come back and be recolonized. But the population is very dynamic, they're having and flowing across waterships constantly, with or without human intervention. It's really cool to watch too, isn't it, Mark, because you can go through it you can see where they were maybe 10, 20 years ago and see all the cuts. And they're not there now. But you can see all the new growth coming up. And you're right, they'll come back. And so when I say there's large stretches on the East Fork that don't have beaver, you're right, they'll come back. Well, in some Long places on the East Fork yeah. probably are not. You know, there are places in watersheds that aren't appropriate for beaver. 
either because of the slope, you know, the, the gradient, or the availability of um, food. Um, th there are places where it's just not a place for people to be. And they won't go there, and right? They won't go right. there. And right. so for us to say that, oh gosh, that's unhealthy now because there's no beaver there, isn't it? Isn't the whole story? Broader, isn't the whole story? Not every, not every place and every drainage is beaver habitat right. or potential beaver habitat. So we have to be careful about sort of generalizing, you know, that every watershed should have beaver because not every watershed probably is a potential habitat for beaver. Well, actually. Yeah, my my trick point. I know this area quite well. Been all in, in the past. Yeah, they are. Basically, they they know how to adjust to a situation if left alone. There's always security first in the beaver. Beaver wants to be secure, and but the landforms show it. The landforms show it everywhere. Every every drainage has the beavers in there. Everyone. But of course, you got in, you got people moving in, wanted to tap the farmland as much as they can up to the mountain <coughs> edge. And some of that habitat might have been preferred in the lower, and then they were forced up more. Or, or different times through, through history, but yeah, all the landforms show it. It's up to where here, because you know, I'm a geologist, and I studied this whole area in geology, too, and so that landform, and that was a pain in the butt to my geologist friends, because I'm the animal biologist, and animal, you know, bringing another element into what's going on, other than just looking at sediment flow and sediment natural processes and geological, physical properties. So, Mark, is there anything that I can do to help you guys? Because, like I told Martha, I do make films, and the reason I make films mostly is so I have a good excuse to go outside and to view wildlife and to just enjoy nature. But is there anything that I can do to help you guys to get your message out? Well, I don't know. I, mean, I appreciate the passion. Um, the reason I want that tape on is I don't want to miss what I can do to yeah, help well, you. Well, I'm, I'm just trying to think. I mean, I appreciate the passion. I appreciate you wanting to get to get the you know help get the message out. Um, uh, I think I think one one thing is to think about this, and it's not just about an individual species, or is to think about it in terms of you know. An, you know, the bigger picture that also includes humans and humans and interests. And, and, you know, your passion about beaver and what you see as, you know, important and beautiful up on Meat Creek, we've got people that we're hearing from that are just as passionate that are concerned about what beaver do in places on Meat Creek. And, and, so I think an appreciation for other people's values is, and what they see um, as important um, is really important in this, in, you know, maintaining a good dialogue on an issue like Beaver. Um, because for all your passion, we hear equal and opposite passion yeah. on, on other sides. And, and so does the Forest Service. And um, and other man and other land managers and resource managers and and so that's kind of the you know what we're blessed with as public servants is we have to listen to all the public, not just you know this passionate group and that passionate group and side with one or the other. We have we have to listen to everybody and formulate all that into our decisions as well as any, you know any biological information that we may have. Well, that's so why it's important to get the educate. It's always an educational issue. I mean, you've got people who, like I just mentioned, with Aspen, you know, they have this mindset. And so any little thing affects it, affects, you know, that that's a pa becomes a passion for them. It's because they don't know the understanding or the relationships or things or the benefits or the real importance of, of this particular keystone species and watershed in general, which, of course, is always going to be an issue in the West. And it is elsewhere, too. I mean, they're, that's why they utilize them more. And because here it's, it's more delicate because we have this history, you know, the trappers. I, I deal with the Four Hall replica people and those, and, and I tell some of these guys, I said, you got to come to the thing. No, they're not the trappers that meet her up there and up in Possum Gibson. What, what's that? Where they met this year, the new place. Uh, anyways, it was up in the McCammon area. And, and I was up there with a cannon, of course, really blow holes and things with like that. <laughs> the thing is, I said, they're muzzle loaders. That's the muzzle loader group. You know, they're not the 
trappers, you know, but the perspective is that's the trappers. Those are the mountain men. They just go up there and they're trapping. No, they're going out and shooting guns and bows and throwing axes and everything else. There ain't even no water there. Boys and toys. Paul, to add on to, to Martha's suggestions, um, yeah, I, I think you could help us a lot by by helping the community not only understand the, the role and the value of beavers in our watersheds and the, the ecosystem services that they provide, but we could really use your help in, in uh, passing the, the message on that we do have a beaver management program and an acreage drainage that is designed to and intended to provide for a healthy, sustainable beaver population that serves those needs. And that trap and live transport or kill permits or trapping is all compatible with those objectives. And it, it isn't that whether we have them or not, we are going to have each one of those management tools in the future of how they're employed and what they're designed to to give us for management objectives that serve the needs and desires of folks that want more beaver and the folks that Mark had just described that frankly would like to see fewer beaver because they have concerns of, of their ornamental trees being cut down or the county having their roads flooded and culverts plucked or um, some folks that simply don't want to see the, the uh, Cherry Springs trail system flooded and not not be as convenient or accessible for school tours and other things. That's one of the, the serious objections that, that we received in the last several years is <clears throat> those trees that are being felled and the, and the beaver activity in, in Mink Creek and the Cherry Springs area is interfering with the public's use of that recreation area. So how do you how do you balance all of this? Uh, yeah, you can you can play. See, I think I need to get the con part a little more. I mean, I, I've got a lot of the pros, mm -hmm. <laughs> but I think you're right, Mark. I'd like to hear more of the cons. So we can maybe come together and figure out is there some middle ground here that we can agree on and work from there. That would be that would be a great thing to work with us on to, to try to achieve some of that common understanding. Because then if we get some common understanding, like you, you're right, because those people have real concerns, and let's talk about it and figure out you know, where we can agree on, and then work from there and see if we can make that Cherry Springs area, because that Cherry Springs area is really highly visible, and if you can make that area work, then you can start working, if you get that to work, then maybe there's another place in Idaho where if there's a conflict, you can go, okay, this is what we did here, maybe we can use the tools that are in your management box, you know, they're just like a any tools that I have in my toolbox, I don't use them all when I fix a car. There's different tools that fit different needs. Like you're saying, Mark, there's different places for beaver where it's going to work, like you guys said. And I agree with you. I think yep. Gibson Jack's a great place. And so, yeah, I'm more than willing to figure out what tools are in the toolbox and how they're used and when they're used. You know, well, we use this tool when you have a head gasket blowing that uh, culvert's that's the blowing head gasket, and it's immediate. So, great. I, I, I think we're really, we have more more common ground here, maybe, than, than it's typical than we understood before we sat down and talked. And I Pardon? think that's true. I think, you know, one of the, I think in some ways there's a misconception that because fish and game allows trapping, has trapping season, manages trapping, and issues permits to kill problem beaver that for some reason we don't value beaver and we don't recognize their their values to a healthy ecosystem and that couldn't be further from the truth yeah. there's, 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 there's nothing you know nothing that can be further from the truth but but you can still recognize those values and you know try to manage for those values at the same time that you're addressing other people's concerns. And it's really important that we do that. And by addressing the concerns of the other people, it does help, I think, with their tolerance overall of the species. And we all want to be so, heard. 
you know, if you if you're addressing if you're addressing that irrigator's problem and his diversion and his irrigation ditch, and you show that you can address that, then he's much more tolerant of maintaining.